case hotel coffee All right, is my mic clear? ETM Hotel, I'm, on, I'm in my row. Boop, 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 boop. Kobe, how my mic sound, man? good all right give me a second I gotta start some controversy so I gotta put this uh, video in the indigenous group <laughs> I gotta start some controversy I'm gonna try not to be long. Um, I'm gonna jump into it in just a minute and uh, uh, do our sanfi uh, for a great Sini Kofi uh, for a great bill on Queen and Zinga. Uh, if anybody didn't watch it, it'll be up soon on YouTube, but it's on this Facebook Live right now. So make sure y'all check that out. It's been shared in a hundred groups or more. But, uh, man, I appreciate everybody jumping in in this live stream. Um, we're going to talk about some shipbuilding technology today. Um, I did a previous presentation maybe two weeks ago on um, the slave trade and ships that were involved in the slave trade and so forth. But we didn't really get into the technology and what made it uh this discovery of the portuguese uh so important to western europe and uh its breakthrough uh in the you know uh 15th century which led to mass kidnappings of uh our ancestors and uh being shipped all over the world and you know during the age of discovery but um as long as my mic good man i'm gonna get started here in just a second i told y'all i gotta be controversial with this one so i gotta uh i gotta let the indigenous people know what's going on right now because a lot of them you know they have some questions and uh, hopefully this this will further answer those questions. Shouldn't have to keep repeating ourselves, but we're doing the presentations just for the sake of we don't have to continue to repeat ourselves. We just give them give them what we got. Let them roll over the information and what they can um, gain or get from it. Then you know, hey, if it's something they disagree with, then they can challenge it and. If it's something need to be corrected, they can do that too. And we must remain scientific. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Mo. This gonna be good. This about like them uh like that that uh phone call you were trying to get me and Garfield on with uh with the pastor and and uh the deacon board and the uh the the what's the sisters um with the big hats in the church with them ladies but uh so yeah we're going to explore new t you know explore new territory shipbuilding technology of the portuguese uh by me i uh, hold on i see jack in the building peace out to jackie that's my homeboy man since i was a pup i see joseph coleman on board he might have clicked off though 
Uh, I don't expect too many people, but we're going to get right into it. As always, man, when I like to, when I'm doing something I like to turn up on, we got to do it like this one time for the Masi, where it's African brothers and sisters. Let me know if y'all can hear. Hold on, hold on. Can y'all hear that? I can't. No, y'all can't. Y'all finna watch me edit this live. Cause I don't wanna go back and do nothing old. All right, let's go. Let's do it right. My apologies. Let's go to war. All right, Kofi, can I be heard? My mic good? All right, I'm just trying to make sure my mic good. No such ship could do anything against an adverse wind, though the square sail gave stability to large ships. Even the most powerful ships on the, in the, of the ancient world had a few sailing seasons limited to months between April and November. Few boats could expect to survive the effects of the wind in the winter on the sea. The key to further development was a revolution in maritime technology. Over two centuries from 1400 to 600s or so, Europeans developed the art of navigation in a way that changed the whole geopolitical order of human societies. Shortly after 1500, European society, which up to this time had been relatively insignificant in comparison with the Islamic world or with China, began to achieve the combination of sails and guns that was to give it naval dominance over any possible challenger. The economic and commercial revolution that ensued may have been still more important than the relocation military power. All the coasts of Africa were now open to European seaborne trade. The first and formal, the first and most dramatic breakthrough for West Africa and for the whole world was achieved in the early 15th century by the Portuguese mariners whose names are not even recorded. 
their problem was uh, their problem was navigating, excuse me, navigation along the Sahara coast of Maritina. These waters were extremely difficult for early sailing ships, not because of storms and rough seas, but because the northeast trade winds blow all year long in the same direction. Accompanied by a strong southward flowing ocean current, mariners had long been able to sail against the wind by attacking back and forth, but it was much more difficult to make headway against both wind and current. Medieval Mediterranean ships, both Christian and Muslim, were perfectly capable of sailing south along the Sahara coast. The problem was to get back to the north of the desert. So, ships used to hug close to the continent in order to travel. And as you can see here in this particular passage, they just had a problem getting back north. They couldn't get back north. They couldn't go far west. They couldn't go far off the continent because the current would take them places un unknown to them at this particular time. And since the wind swirled in many directions, you couldn't get a good ample read on where you were going and you didn't, you know, you didn't know where you were going to end up. So in the age of the discovery, this technology that we're about to get to helped the Portuguese break through and control like, like you've seen in the previous slide. One part of the solution was the gradual improvement of sailing ships until a type had emerged that could sail sufficiently close to the wind. By the be beginning of the 15th century, such ships were available based on modification of hull and rigging drawn from the experience of the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic coast of Europe. This made possible a series of experimental Portuguese voyages down the coast towards Senegal. The Portuguese mariners apparently learned sometime in the early 15th century that they could return northward if they used the small during alter, uh, alternation of wind direction by which the wind shifted slightly onshore during daylight and offshore at night. But even with discovery, the coastal route northward from Senegal was too time consuming and difficult for use as a regular trade route. So when people say that ships could travel, well, boats could leave the continent of West Africa and make it to the Americas, how so with different winds and the lack of technology at that time. So here's the breakthrough in technology. The Portuguese breakthrough in shipping technology came, can be narrowed down into a few key components. The three masts with a square sail on their main mast, but a triangle ones on the other two. This enabled them to begin to face the Atlantic with much greater confidence since they could meet an adverse wind, but at the same time expect a measure of stability from their square sail. The next breakthrough is the sea quadrant invented in 1456, which the sailor measured, measured the elevation of the pole star by a plumb line passing over an engraved scale. That transformed nocturnal sailing. The combination of these changes enabled the sea captains to envisage, for the first time, long journeys across the sea without sight of land. Let's look at this ship. This is just a 360 image of what one of the ships would look like in Portugal. You see this ship compared to the other ships uh, or boats or whatever they have over there on the dock. This is an actual replica of a slave ship. This is what it would look like. The early ones. As time grew on, technology advanced them and they started to look different. They started using naval ships and so forth. Now you have to remember, 
the beginning of the kidnapping, they did not come west. They went back to Western Europe. And people would ride these ships. It would be maybe 100 to 200 passengers on board, kidnap victims at times, before they really start packing them up. The Portuguese, Western Europeans, were pioneers in the shipping industry. They opened up trade at an immense scale. In a time period where people were just navigating through the Mediterranean like it was nothing, but nobody ever took to the Atlantic. The Mediterranean, you could manage, but the Atlantic, because of the winds and the currents, it'll swallow you whole and spit you back out. You'll never return. Now this is only a few minutes, so I kind of hope you can suck in the uh, the video, the images, basically. The music will put you to sleep, though. Moving on. It was, however, a necessary step to the real breakthrough, the discovery that if a ship sailed northwest from the vicinity of Dakar, that Senegal, keeping as close as possible into the northeast trades along uh, tack, she would finally come to a part of the ocean near the Azores, where winds blow from all points of the compass, but mainly from the west. From there, it was an easy sail back to Portu Portugal, Spain, Morocco, or Straits of Gibraltar. It would be hard to overestimate the importance of this discovery, which lay behind the better publicized achievements of Columbus, da Gama, and their successors. It also lay behind the next steps toward the formation of South Atlantic system first. The movement of Mediterranean plantation agriculture out in the Atlantic Basin, and then its direct link to West Africa by way of the maritime slave trade. The westward migration of sugar plantations began even before the discovery of America. Three minutes. I'm gonna press a point here. We're just gonna see some images of the Portuguese. I might not even do the whole three minutes of this. These are just pain images of what the ships would look like. Thank <laughs> you. 
tools used for navigation. We're going to take a look at a few tools. There was one tool that I did not add in the presentation, and my apologies, but you can look it up. It's called an astrolobe. Uh, it will be used later on. However, um, what we're looking at, of course, everybody should know this is an hourglass. And uh, the hourglass look like two glass globes connected by a narrow opening. One of the globes is filled with sand. The ship's officer in charge of mining the hourglass position the instrument with the sand, uh, sand filled globe on top in a full size hourglass. Uh, it took exactly one hour for the sand to seep through the narrow passageway to the globe at the bottom. Now, uh, the gentleman that actually manned the time uh, would actually write, you know, would take notes on where he, were, where, where he was at. So every time an hour would pass, as they were making their voyages, you know, he would make a little strike or something in his notepad where he could keep up with where they are as far as uh, how long a, a voyage was to and from wherever their destination was. Um, if it was a half hour or something like that, then he would, you know, make a little half or something like that so he can dictate it was point something. Uh, not exactly accurate way to do things, but at that time with the technology that they had, it seemed like the best thing they had going. Uh, like the ancient stone circles, the sundial worked in a position level with the earth. This is a sundial. Uh, most people will be familiar with this if you've ever studied uh, Napta Player and uh, and Kemet, where you could, you know, where you see those famous stones that've been there for quite some time to figure out how, you know, they figured out how to use time to their advantages and so forth. But just as stone circles were oriented toward the North Star, the navigator turned the sundial so that the Roman numeral 12 pointed toward the north. We will talk about the commas in a second, which really I'm not going to elaborate on it much. As the sun shone on the sundial during the day, the genome shadow moved around the dial. So he knew the direction of the sun. You had to. Uh, or the North Star. And you, because it would start on one side. And if you know anything from me, well, how I sunset it raises in one direction and sets in another and at high noon it sits directly over you like it ain't no thing uh someone back in time noticed that a certain rock had a natural attraction the metal iron we call that type of rock or mineral uh magnetic as a tool the magnetic rock is referred to as a lodestone if iron is present, the positive end of the stone will turn its attention to the iron. If no iron is present, the positive end will turn its attention to the North, uh, the North Pole. What you're looking at right there is the compass. I didn't come out and say that off top, but yes, you're looking at a compass. So you needed an hourglass. You needed a compass and you needed a sundial, just to name a few. You needed to know what a North Star is. You heard that mentioned twice uh, in the previous slides. You have to locate the North Star. These people learned over time how to do that based on where they were. All right, this thing right here is quite interesting. And we'll see a video that'll get into this uh, in a minute. But this is a cross staff, which measures the angle of the sun to the horizon at its highest point at noon or by the height of Polaris at night. See, this cross staff a killer flat earther because it deals with the horizon and the sun and so forth. You can find a latitude by yourself at noon. Stand straight and tall. Point one of your hands toward the sun and the other toward the horizon. Measure the angle between your arms, the angle you determine your latitude. Interesting. Mariners needed to know how far below the ship lay, the seafloor. If the water was too shallow, his boat ran aground. If it was too deep, his anchor line could not reach. So they would use these things like a, a sound and loud marker. Uh, it would basically make a noise 
Uh, if you ever seen one of these in action, long rope, they'll throw it out there in the water and it, you know, it'll cling, cling, cling. If it's hitting up against rocks and that vibrate or whatever, and you know, they call it a lead plummet. Navigators use a chip reel or a long reel, also called chip long, chip long, and just log. Measure how fast the ship traveled. So this is how they see how fast they're going. Oh, we're going 20 knots, 60 knots, you know, something crazy like that. This ancient tool consisted of a chip or a small log of wood tied to the end of a long line, similar to a sounding line, knots tied at consistent intervals, but provided measurement logs. So based on the length, they could determine what they were doing. So let's take a look at a couple of those instruments that we just mentioned in the presentation outside of the astrolobe, which I did not mention. Captain Jim Sharp, a longtime skipper of the Schooner Adventure, has cut a larger than life swath down the main coast for five decades. As a schoonerman, waterfront developer, and epic storyteller, his pursuits are legendary and his friends are countless. Now in his 80s, Jim has turned his energies to a maritime museum featuring artifacts that he and his many friends and colleagues have collected for decades. The Sail, Power, and Steam Museum in Rockland, Maine is one of our favorite hidden off-center places to visit. Sit back and enjoy as Jim takes you through the development of navigation tools over the last 2,000 years. This is just one small exhibit at his very cool museum. While Diego Cao pushed the boundaries for how far a man could sail south along the coast of Africa, cartographers and scientists in Europe busily analyzed the survey and astrological data Portuguese and other explorers had brought home with them. In 1484, probably before Diego Cao returned from his expedition, King Jao established a council of astronomers and mathematicians to perfect navigation instruments and devise a method to measure latitude using solar observation the rule of the sun. The explorers who had sailed below the equator returned with complaints that their astrolobes were no longer useful when they lost sight of Polaris. The scientific council became known as the Junta Mathematico is basically what that says. So some key elements about the rule of the sun. Um, when, they, when they got to the equator, when they go below the equator, they would lose sight of the polaris, which caused problems for them on their journeys back because they you fear getting lost. Now, if you're an explorer and you're traveling along the coast of West Africa and you're trying to get back to Portugal and you end up in a wrong area where you just kidnap hundreds of people, oh, they will get free because some people go come, jump on the ship, and take the ship. Astronomers in Nuremberg, where the majority of astrolobes and other precision instruments were manufactured, and Abraham Zakoto, remember this name, Abraham Zakoto, 
an astronomer at the University of Salamanca in Castile, had already been working on this problem. He solved the problem. They had concluded that NATIS needed a method for determining the angular distance north or south of the celestial equator at midday, noon. The mathematicians in King Giles Junta Mathematico were given the task of creating mathematical functions that involve physical relationship of the sun to the horizon of the equator. The, ast the astronomers were given the task of measuring those physical relationships, measurements that change from place to place every day. The tools available to the astronomers were the cross staff quadrant, magnetic compass, and astrolabe. Previously, you heard me mention those in other slides. During the first part of the century, astronomers could compare the position of the celestial bodies, planets, stars, moon, and sun at different times of day, night, and season from various places in Europe. But not until Fernel de Pol returned crossing the equator in 1469 and Diego Cayo displayed how easy it was to dash between the equator and Lisbon in his caravel in 1480. Could astronomers take measurements of the relationship of celestial bodies from the equator itself or south of it? This data was recorded on tables known as ephemerides. A single table is an ephemeris, and compiled into books and calendars that were useful guides known as almanacs. Abraham's Akuto had between 1470 and 1478 created a book called Ha-Hibu Hagado, well in Hebrew, the great book in English, <laughs> with 65 detailed astrological charts predicting and describing hundreds of celestial activities. The book is more commonly known by its title, Almanac Perpetuum, or the Perpetual Almanac. This is what the, uh, the almanac looked like, y'all. And this is what uh, Zakato kept record. And every day he would make specific notes in detail about the celestial bodies. The inventions and research by Abraham Zacuto was 35 years old in 1486 and close in age to Christopher Columbus, John Cabot, and Martin Beham would become key ingredients to the exploration of the Southern Atlantic. As you shall see, uh, see he becomes the personal tutor of Vasco da Gama. Zacuto was a, a Sephardic Jew. You heard me. Garfield, I know you're listening. He was a Jew whose talents included astronomer, mathematician, rabbi, astro astrology, and historian. He was also versed in Jewish law. Later, he will write the first comprehensive history of the Jewish people. He was referred to as being from Salamanca, where he became the chief astronomer at the university there. Some of his research was based on the 14th century work of a group of astronomers known as the Magikai School. We met Abraham Kresge at the school. Yeah, he's a Sephardic Jew. You know it's a problem. In 1484, the Junta Mathematico updated the simplified Zacuta's Almanac. They also developed methods to help uh, competent, <laughs> yes, competent mariners use the revised guidebook. A former student at the protege of Zacuta's name, Jose Vizinho, whom King Jao had drafted uh, for his Junta Mathematico, translated the Almanac from Hebrew to Latin. In 1485, after Diego Cayo returned from his first expedition, Jose Vizinho sailed south to the equator to test the new methods and double check Abraham's Akuta's measurements. It is uh, probable that Vizinho sailed with uh, Diego Cayo as part of his second expedition, along with Cayo was uh, Jao Afonso de Avaro, who, uh, who it appears later submitted the report of the expedition. According to Nuremberg uh, Chronicle, this is a primary source when you see that. Nuremberg Chronicle, published in 1493, Martin Beham, the German scholar, astrologer, map maker, and prospective explorer from Nuremberg was also part of the expedition. That's, a, that's what you call firsthand, primary, witness to what they were doing when they were making these expeditions. This wasn't made up. They've been you know, doing this thing. 
Martin Baham of Nuremberg had been a student of German mathematician and astronomer. I don't know how to say his name, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Reggio Montanus, also from Bavaria. Montanus, who uh, had passed away in 1476, was a generation older than Abraham Zakuda and Martin Behaim. Behaim was also interested in the rule of the sun and may have been part of King Giles Junta Mathematico. Once Diego Cayo shipped near the equator, the scientists followed a complicated, time-consuming, and difficult procedure made more difficult by a moving ship. Their goal was to note the highest altitude of the sun at every at the very moment it occurred at midday. With an eyeglass and Zacuto's table at hand, the scientists began taking their measurements a bit earlier than they thought midday would occur and kept taking the same measurement until the altitude started to diminish, indicating that they had passed the exact moment of the meridian transit, the exact moment of midday. They were methodical in their research and how to travel during the age of ex exploration, they had to have this information in order to pull off the biggest jack move in history. The scientists probably jotted their measurements down on some sort of slate board, like a blackboard, then translated the data to pen and ink manuscripts at a later time. The results of the experiment were, the published in, uh, were then published in Portugal in a new almanac titled Rigamento de Astrolobia. E do quadrant, official astrolobe and quadrant recordings. You can look that up, official astrolobe and quadrant recordings. You can find the primary. Here's a look at uh, a translated almanac in Portugal 1486 at the time. Remember, this is translated. Originally, it was written in Hebrew because he was a Sephardic Jew. On these ships doing all this work so they can be precise they knew what they were funding so they can get paid the almanac included a number of things it listed the latitudes from Lisbon to the equator by today's standard those measurements were off by only 10 minutes to a half degree the book predicted lunar eclipses and even contained sun sightings for leap year it will remain a basic reference to Portuguese and Spanish navigators for the next hundred years. However, it took a skilled and well-educated navigator to use the almanac. Learning to navigate by mathematical reasoning was a new process for seamen in the 1480s. As we discussed in our article about navigation, mariners had previously relied on their experience and understanding the sea, pole star, and other natural landmarks. Nonetheless, the new methods were reliable on navigator's ability to measure how far he had sailed using landmarks, his ability to tell time with hourglass, and the ability to measure speed with the chirp reel and rudimentary tools. The new technology helped navigators measure a ship's position north and south, in other words, his latitude. However, it would be a long time before navigators learned how to precisely measure a ship's location east and west, i.e. longitude. Longitude measurements is bound to time measurement. The clock or time piece had yet to be invented. And whereas the distance between one latitude and another latitude is consistent, the difference between one longitude and another longitude varies depending on the latitude. For example, the distance between 45 degrees west longitude and 60 degrees west longitude is greater at the equator than it is at a 45 degree north latitude. <clears throat> now this is an image of what we basically just went over so if you're trying to predict where you're going or how you're going to get there look at what they were doing here they used time the hourglass they took notes from that they studied the rotation of the sun at hot noon and so forth to come up with these degrees. Once they had mapped out their degree perspectives, they knew it would take X amount of time to get somewhere based on the currents. Earlier in the presentation, I told you that they mastered 
the sails, the triangular and the square sails, which would help them navigate those strong winds, which other boats could not maneuver in because they would get lost, sunken or rid of. And you also heard in the presentation, the gentleman said that they also lost a lot of ships and men without this technology. Martin Behan used the information he acquired from his trip to the equator to improve the astrolobe for the Portuguese so that it worked better below the equator. Possibly he refined the star chart on the plate so that it matched the southern sky. That would have required him to adjust the written to match the new chart. Once the scientific experiments were completed, Diego Cayo could, uh, could continue to the Congo where he sailed upriver to look for the emissaries he had left behind in 1484. He also wanted to find out if the river led to Ethiopia and the kingdom of Prester John. I'm, I'm gonna say that again. He also wanted to find out if the river led to Ethiopia and the kingdom of Prester John. Anybody familiar with Prester John know he's a myth. At this point, the Portuguese lie was told to them and spread throughout history as somebody named Preston John who knew all the gold was and had a big old kingdom somewhere in Africa, possibly in Ethiopia. Nobody in Ethiopia know who he is or in the continent of Africa. So they came in under the assumption, waving their little flags, talking about we looking for Preston John. The ship was able to navigate as far as uh, Yellow Falls where Diego Kyle, one of his parties, left in this on a rock. Now, we'll take a look at a, well, I don't know if I did add the rock in here. We'll see. The inscription still exists when the photo shown below was taken in 1910. The inscription was filled in the white chalk to make them more readable for the photo. If you read Portuguese, maybe you can tell us what it says. Who read Portuguese? This is the inscription that uh, Diego Kyle left on a stone in Africa. Yalala Falls. The photo was taken in 1910. It would be this image if you watch Kofi presentation, they always left these crosses or cross marks everywhere they go and then something written next to them in their ugly flag. To the left of the cross is the ugly flag that normally would be a bunch of crosses, but for some reason we got dots. Along the way up river and down river, Diego Kyle placed his order of the cross pillars and met with uh, native Congolese who accepted his Christian religion. After returning to the river mouth, he coasted south again. These records do not say whether or not Diego retrieved four emissaries. All right, so here's a map. I mentioned a couple of places on here in other presentations, but let's just deal with the facts. The Portuguese will always leave from Lisbon because that was a major shipping port for them, especially dealing with slaves, okay? They would travel. Look how they would hug the coast of West Africa until they got on down. Now, you heard me say something about Yalala Falls, which is close to the Congo because it's near the river. Right. So they can get up through that. They can get to that point where the river is and they can either put their ship on the coastline and take smaller boats through the Congo or they can get out and walk wherever they want to walk forever if they wanted to. Now, according to J. Alfonso de Avaro, who made it back to Portugal safely, the expedition reached Cape Cross in today's Nambia, where Diego Cayo got sick and died. Meanwhile, the Portuguese were heading to India by a different route than under Africa. All right, so earlier in the presentation, you heard me talking about the currents, the wind, and how all of that goes. 
Well, here is a good uh, a good image of those currents. When you get off the coast of Portugal or West Africa, those winds could go all over the place, leading you in directions you're not trying to go. And if you do not have the correct sails to navigate those winds, you would end up off track. So let's look at this from this perspective. We have a group of people who stated that the ancient remage, the Egyptians, left the Nile Valley and traveled to the Americas. Where did, which way did they go? Did they leave the Red Sea, come through the Indian Ocean, and then come around a good cape in, uh, in reed boats and kufus, which was not prepared to face these water winds and it would have just swallowed up and died? Or did they come through the Mediterranean, pass all these people in the Mediterranean, and come into dangerous waters up near Lisbon and the west coast of Africa? How the heck did they get from the Nile all the way through the Mediterranean? You can get through the Mediterranean. I can give you that. But when you get to the Atlantic, if you're not hugging the coast, look at the winds, the wind patterns. If you're not hugging the coast, it's going to take you farther out. And if you do not have the technology to get for, you know, to control yourself in those winds, you're going to end up somewhere dead. The water does not play. All right. So I want to look at this image again. But we're going to take a look at this same boat we saw earlier, but just out at sea. Not too far off the coastline. Look at how the sails are. Triangle. They ain't even released the other one, the square one, to guide it against certain winds. But that's just an area view. Now, records from 1441 reveal the first appearance of the new ship design by Henry's team. One of his captains. Nuno Tristeo arrived in the river marked by a rock that looked like a galley ship, probably commanding a caravan. Tristeo had grown up with Henry in the Portuguese royal court and was one of his best friends. We're talking about Prince Henry, the navigator. Excuse me. He was high up in the chain of command for the Order of Christ, which I asked Kofi to build on that. And we need to do a build on the Order of Christ because a lot of people don't know what the Order of Christ is. The experienced captain probably had a lot to do with the new ship's sleek and elegant design. All right, so you heard this mentioned the other day, the Caravel. If you watch uh, St. Kofi's presentation, we want to we wanna see what we can find up on the Caravel, which is a famous ship. Caravels were fast and maneuvered easily. Most had two masts. Remember I said the, the mast was the breakthrough in the technology. A main mast and a mizzen mast. The key to the new design was the triangular shaped sails that allowed the ship to move against the wind at an angle, a maneuver called tacking, as this, uh, these sails became popular on ships from Latin-speaking countries, i.e. Italy, Spain, and Portugal. They became known as the Latin sails. Remember earlier in the presentation, I said the breakthrough in technology was the triangular shaped cells and the square cell. When they figured out how to go against them winds, they could attack further into the Atlantic and explore the whole world. In contrast to galleys, caravels had superstructures built on the front and the stern back. The superstructures were known as castles 
because they raised decks and enclosed walls protected soldiers from flying arrows. Typically during a sea battle, one boat uh, settled up against another boat. Soldiers jumped from boat to boat to fight. The extra decks gave the soldiers a height advantage. Castles built on the bow of the forward end of the ship were known as forecastles, shortened to folks. <laughs> castles built at the stern or at, after end were known as the stern castles or after castles. Most caravels had two store stern castles and one store forecastle. Henry's designer got rid of the side steering oil as well. They replaced it with the swiveling wooden rudder at the stern to steer the ship. The helmsman moved the rudder by pushing or pulling a long arm that extended from the top of the, uh, the rudder called a tiller. With the newly designed caravels, Prince Henry's captains could sail farther, faster, and more efficient. Some of the caravels were very small, which allowed their captains to zip all around the Atlantic. Most importantly, they could return home, tacking back, back and forth against the wind. This is an inside picture of what we're talking about, the tiller, the rudder, the steer, all of this stuff goes hand in hand. Their ability to conquer this problem that they had earlier on gave them the ability to maneuver the way they wanted to. Another image of the ship, you see it on the back, it says the rudder. A model of the caravel, Victoria, which was very large at 85 tons, is, a, uh, is on display at the Dignam Rock Museum. Somebody says where the ships are, well you can go to Dignam Rock Museum near Fall River, Massachusetts, and you can see this caravel model on display. The Victoria was part of the Fernandez Magellan's fleet. After natives killed Magellan in the Philippines, one of his captains, a Spaniard named Juan Sebastian del Cano, sailed the Victoria back to Spain. The cross on her sails is the banner of the Order of Sail, Tiago or Santiago. The actual Victoria was 90 feet long. She only had one litten sail and at the stern. Here's an image. Another image, one Latin sail, sail at the stern. Here's a model in Fortress Museum in Portugal. Now we want to talk about the Carrick, another ship. By the late 1400s, Portuguese and Spanish shipbuilders were developing the next generation of sailing vessels known as the Carricks. There are as many definitions of the Carrick as there are books about early shipping. The Portuguese Carrick was often referred to as a round boat and sometimes as a supply ship. In general, the design of the Portuguese Carrick combined the old round bottom nails with the more advanced rigging of a caravel. Caravels were fast and agile and could handle the coast of Africa. But as the Portuguese and Spanish ventured farther out into the open ocean and when they were away from civilization longer, they needed larger, sturdier ships. The carrier could hold more men and supplies than a caravel, could stay at sea for longer periods and bring back more treasure. Carrier sported three, sometimes four masts and a combination of square and Latin sails. Remember the uh, mass now that's important and the sails, square and triangle. They also had tall and larger forecastles and stern castles than caravels. A long pointed pole called a bowsprit extended from, you guessed it, the bow, a strategic weapon or a war when one ship wanted to ram another ship. Actually, the bowsprit was not meant to serve as a ramming rod but rather as an anchor point for the four-stray, the part of rigging that kept the mast from falling backwards. <laughs> Here's a partial list of some of the characters we are going to hear about. In 1488, Bartolomeu D uh, Diaz sailed in a character named Sao Cristovo when he rounded the Cape of Good Hope. She was piloted by Pero de Alcor, 
Vasco da Gama sailed in a carrack from Lisbon to India in 1497 to 1498, a round trip of 27,000 miles. Her name was the Sail Gabrielle. In 1497, John Cabot sailed in a carrack named the Matthew to Newfoundland. In 1492, Christopher uh, Columbus crossed the ocean sea in a carrack named Santa Maria. The, P uh, the Pinta was also a carrack. The Nina was a caravel. Christopher Columbus introduced the hammock, which he learned about from the American Indians. Indians, until then, crew members slept on the wood decks. Hammocks were often hung four layers deep from the deck head, the deck head of the side of the ship. A model of Vasco de Gamo's flagship, Sail Gabriel. It's at the Rock Museum. We seen an image of it earlier. This is a different view. You see that round at the front of the ship is round, then it kind of flicks in in the back. The play card next to the model states that Lisbon Meriden Museum Workshop built this model in 77 on a scale of 130, 1 to 30. The actual sail Gabriel was 85 feet long and carried 50 tons of cargo. Note the order of Christ symbol on the sails. The play card by the model notes that the cross was unique because it was only one with extremities terminating in a 45 degree angle. Vasco da Gama belonged to the order of Sao Tiago. He may not have displayed the cross from the order of Christ on his first voyage to India. He joined the order of Christ later in life. With these ships, the Portuguese discovered a far larger world than anyone in Europe previously thought even existed. They brought Africa, America, and Asia within reach of European commerce, conquest, and colonization. The ship. Courtesy of the Royal 
Amani Air Force put it in a lovely position for us. We're very early into the archaeological assessments of the 2,800 individual artifacts. For the first time, we're seeing some very rare African ceramics. We have an Asian ceramics from the Ming Dynasty. So these are the sorts of details that the archaeologists over the next several years are going to be teasing out from this collection. While I have felt confident a long time ago, in nearly 18 years, the captain of one of these ships was called Vicente Sodre. V S. It really has been very satisfying and fulfilling to do all the scientific analysis, and that has been a necessary exercise, but it's been an enjoyable one as well. Hard, but enjoyable. So they discovered a shipwreck off the coast, and uh, they found this because of some documentations. They heard a story about the shipwreck, went into the, you heard them stated, into the archives, the Portugal archives, and found letters about the shipwreck, gathered a crew, went out to find the ship that wrecked in the sea and they've been doing it ever since they got other stuff that they're looking for that they come across tons you heard them say they got plenty of scientists in every field breaking these discoveries down so there are people out there doing this here are my sources And this will conclude my presentation.
So yeah, um, what you for those who stuck around during the whole thing, um, get what what you just witnessed was um, a breakthrough in technology regarding the shipping business, uh, shipping or sailing, I should say, at sea. Um, it wasn't until the Portuguese uh, discovery of the mass and the sails to counter the winds and everything that went into the scientific know-how, uh, which allowed ships to go further out and sea away from land. Uh, prior to that, um, as you heard it state, and as I have shown, um, ships were sailing close to land and uh, they had problems returning to their destinations because they didn't have the technology to advance themselves back in the direction from which they came. So, um, with that being said, they couldn't get to the Americas in those boats that we've seen in ancient times, not even the Vikings, not even uh, uh, people that stayed out at sea. Um, these people roamed, uh, when you say out at sea, they, they roamed off the coastlines. They weren't far away from it. Now, um, the Mediterranean was, a was like boat heaven, I would suppose, because people were always waging war with each other. The navels at that time, um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too pretty of a sight. And at the time that you're having these people, these Europeans, uh, and so forth, waging war amongst each other in the 14th and 15th century, you had these Western Europeans um, trying to take advantage of the time that they actually had to, to uh, discover other parts of the world that were not known to man. And until they did it, it wasn't happening. So now I would like to see the people who believe that either the Egyptians went from way across the Nile through the Mediterranean or the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean, all the way around to the Atlantic and so forth, I like to see evidence. I gave you um, three heavy sources using chroniclers, which are primary documents from people who eyewitness these things. So now I want to see evidence. I want to see I want to see Africans leaving West Africa in them canoe boats trying to get across those waters that that blow in every direction. Ain't happening because those ships, as big as those ships were, they were hugging the continents until technology advanced. Until they started uh, creating bigger boats and so forth, but. Man, let me end my let me end this thing. I appreciate everybody tuning in. Even if you didn't watch the whole thing and you flick it off a few times, it's all good. I understand. But uh it's 851. I've been on here too long. Shimmer Hotel. Go in peace. Uh go check out Kofi presentation. If you haven't, uh he just did it earlier. If he already hadn't threw it up on the channel.